There we go. <laughs> okay, Acts. We're going to start start, read, start by reading Acts, and then we're going to kind of uh, we're going to pull it apart a little bit. So uh, this morning we we're talking about the idea of making room for others, uh, and this falls falls in line with our capital campaign that I just talked about. So uh, context. This is coming after uh, after Pentecost. Uh, the, the Spirit of God has settled, and if you remember. There was tongues of fire above their heads and people in the streets, they could hear, uh, they could hear their language being spoken. And some people said, well, they're, they're just drunk. And then they said, well, they can't be drunk. It's only 9 a.m. So then Peter addresses the crowd. Okay. So this comes at the end of Peter's address. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you. So this is this is in response to a question okay so peter goes through his whole address so his address goes from acts 2 14 uh, to 35. so if you want to read that on your own to get a little bit more background and what's going on here but um so somebody asked brothers what shall we do peter and the other apostles uh, um, when the people heard this they were cut to the heart and they said what shall we do? So this is Peter's response to what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who are being saved. Father, thank you that you are a God who multiplies, that you are a God who adds, you are a God who enhances, who, who lifts up and builds. And Lord, right now, as we prepare to make room for others, I pray that you would help us to, to remember what the next right thing is, that you would help us to see your path despite pandemic, despite adversity, and despite storms. And that even though things may, may, may not always be easy, God, I pray that you would remind us that there are others out there who need you and others who need to know you. And I pray, Lord, that we would be a people that constantly seek to make room for others in our hearts and in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' mission was all about making room for other people. The very purpose of his coming was to make room for us in his family. Uh, without Jesus, there wouldn't be any room for our faults. There wouldn't be any room for our failures or our questions or our shortcomings. Because he had such great love for us, he came as a baby, born in a manger. See, because he loves us, room has been made for humanity to intersect with his divinity. And there's a beautiful collision that happens there when our humanity meets his, his divinity. In that collision, we find forgiveness, we find justification to God, we find peace within ourselves, and as we talked about a couple weeks ago, we find a peace of God and in God. And we also find our purpose. We find what we're made of, why we're here, what we're doing. You want to go to the next slide, Corey? Uh, Jesus, Jesus taught this. And of course, I don't need to read that because you could probably close your eyes and recite it if I said, what's the greatest commandment? You know, there was, there was a man who was, uh, he was, he was an expert in the law and he was trying to trap Jesus. So he, he said, hey, Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds back, well, what, what do you think the greatest commandment is? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? As any good teacher would do, he didn't just give knowledge. He asked the question to kind of prompt a response. So, of course, the man recited, well, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Because that was, that was, in Jewish tradition, that was the law. But Jesus add, adds on, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. The second is this. 
In other ways, in other words, the second is just as equal to the first. It is attached to the first. It is section 1A. It's not standalone, it's side by side. They're on equal footing. The second is, is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. But I ask you this morning, how can we be loving our neighbor? How do we love our neighbor if we don't make room for them? Now that might sound, sound a little bit ambiguous, but how do, how, do we, how do we make room for somebody? What does that mean to make room for somebody? Well, sure, I mean, you could dust off the seat next to you, you can shimmy over, and that's one way to make room, sure. I'm talking about in your heart. How do you make room for somebody in your heart? Well, it starts by understanding that they're going to let you down sometimes. They're not always going to live up to your expectations. They're going to come with their own baggage. They're going to come with their own hurts, their own habits, their own hang-ups, their own... They're humans. They're people. When we expect things of people that they can't give, we don't have room for them. The only way you can make room for somebody is by accepting their humanity, accepting their fallen nature, the same as it's our fallen nature, because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He accepted our fallen nature in the sense that he knew that we could not help ourselves. God knew that we couldn't do it ourselves. So God could have sat up there and just said, well, <laughs> these guys aren't going to help themselves. Well, too bad. Instead, he accepted that we needed help. He accepted that we couldn't do it on our own. He made room for us in his heart. And he took action to impact us. He took action to correct something. He took action to make something better. He took action to multiply. He took action to make better. And that's exactly what we're doing. By, by making room for people, by loving people, in, in, you know, with regards to what we what we just kind of talked about, loving our neighbors in this context means creating a space, a physical space where people can come and gather and feel welcome and feel invited and feel comfortable. Not even on a spiritual level necessarily, but on a physical level. If you go somewhere and all they have are hard chairs and, you know, the wallpaper is falling off and maybe the room looks like it hasn't been used in 15 years, you're not really going to feel that Welcome there. Has anybody ever stayed in a really bad hotel room? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You stay in this hotel room and you think the cockroaches are going to carry me out the door while I'm sleeping. I got to, you know. It's just, it's incredible. But have you ever stayed? Maybe, maybe, this, is, maybe this is a going home story. Have you ever been away from home, college, university, a long trip, just maybe you moved, and then you come home and you sleep in your childhood bedroom? Maybe you're, you're visiting mom and dad and you, you sleep in the, the, the bedroom that you grew up in, and it's all familiar and it's, you just feel like this is, this is where I belong, like, I, this, is, this is comfortable, this is, because your parents literally made room for you, otherwise you're sleeping in the garage. We've been hanging on to this idea since August. We've been kind of, I shouldn't even say hanging on, we've been kind of coming back to and we've been, been touching on this idea of ecclesia. And if you don't know what ecclesia means by now, I'm about to remind you. So ecclesia is the, the, the Greek word that Jesus used to describe his church. The reason why our, our versions say church is because of King James. And, some of the restrictions he put on the folks who were doing the translation for him. Uh, but Jesus never said that he wanted to establish his church. Jesus said, I want to establish my ecclesia. I want to establish my assembly. And the difference is a church is a, a, is a building. Like, sure, we, we are the church. We know that we are, we are the church. Now, I'm talking about in, when, when, people, when people hear the words, the first thought that pops into their head. Right. When you hear the word church, you think of the building, right? Jesus didn't come to say, uh, I am going to establish a network of buildings all over the world. He didn't say, I'm going to make sure that there is a building in every town where someone can worship me. 
Jesus' idea and Jesus' plan was to establish an assembly of people. It was a people-driven movement. His mission wasn't to establish a religious framework where only the best or most righteous need apply. His goal was to establish a life-giving, culture-shaking, people-driven movement that was accessible and available to every single person on this earth. His goal was to bring us home. And by bringing us home, to bring as many others with us as we can. Jesus made room for us. You're going to hear that a lot this morning. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the generation today, my generation, you know, people who are anywhere from 18 years old all the way up into their, you know, 35, 40 year olds, we're searching, we're looking for something. And we're looking for something different than what our parents had. Because that thing that our parents had, as great as it was, it doesn't impact us the same way. It doesn't appeal to us the same way. It doesn't, it doesn't fit the same way. Now, there are some of you in the room that will understand what I mean when I say, you know, you would ask a question and the answer was the answer because mom and dad said it was the answer and that was good enough for you. We're going to church on Sunday because that's where we go. God is real. You're, that's, that's all you need to know. Jesus is watching. That's all you need to know. Read your Bible. That's all you need to know. Right? I grew up with grandparents like that. My grandfather was like that. When he said something, that was the answer and that should be good enough for you. But you know, a whole generation right now, we're, we're the generation of questions. We're the questioning generation. You know, Kian, my four-year-old, loves this three-letter word called why. Why? 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 Why do we do that? Why are you doing that? But it's never good enough just to give one answer. There's always another why after that answer. Why are you buying cat food? Because we have to feed the cats. Why? Because if we don't feed them, they'll die. Why? Because living things need food. Why? I'm not a biologist. I don't know. We need to set ourselves up and our, our ecclesia, Jesus' ecclesia, needs to be set up and equipped in such a way that we don't presume to have all the answers, but we provide a safe place for people to ask the questions. We need to provide a safe environment for people to say, why? Why does God love me? Why did he die for me? Why do we do communion? Why do we worship? Why does he care if I pray? Why, 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 why? We're, we are the why generation. And if we don't provide a safe place for people to ask the whys and the hows and the whos and the wheres, I'm sorry to tell you, but they're going to ask those questions in the world and they're going to get a worldly answer. And that worldly answer is going to lead them away from the truth. Jesus referred to us as a light on a hill. You don't light a candle in the middle of the room and then put a bowl over it. You leave it on its lampstand so it provides light to the whole room so that people don't stumble and trip over furniture, hurt themselves and get lost and misplace things. How can we as a... I'm going to, I'm going to go back to using the word church because that's, that's familiar. How can we be, be Jesus' church if we're not being a light if we're not letting our light shine, if we're not making room for other people, if we're not providing that space for people to ask those questions and to seek, we need to understand as humans, every single one of us in this room, every single one of us, we are in a different stage of our faith. We are in different faith levels. You know, when you first kind of become a Christian, it's kind of like being a baby. You got to learn how to crawl spiritually crawl. You're learning the basics, how to talk to God, how to walk with God. Just like when you were a baby, you had to learn to walk and talk. And as you grow up, you become more familiar with the walking and more familiar with the talking. And then you learn to run and you learn to communicate. And some of us in this room are perhaps we are in, we are in a spiritual childhood. And that's okay. There is a season for that. It's a season of growth. It's a season of looking and learning. Some of us in this room are spiritual grandparents. You've been there. You've done that. You've got the experience. And now it's your job to help those coming behind you 
to learn the lessons that you learned. Another way of putting it, some, some of us are, are in a spiritual elementary school. We're learning the ABCs and other ones, others, maybe we're going for our spiritual master's degree, our spiritual doctorate. The point is we're all at different stages and those stages come with different questions. They come with different implications. You can't expect somebody who doesn't know to know, you know? So it's up to us to make room for people to be who they are. It's up for us to make room for, for people's faults and their failures. And it's okay if they don't do everything right. I went to church, you know, this is, this is going back years ago. I went to church with a guy who, he, he went every single week. He went every week. And, you know, he was always wanting to help with, you know, he would help with the, the ushering. He would want to volunteer and he was involved. He read the Bible, he worshiped. And then he would go out after service and he would light up a smoke and he would, you know, have a cigarette and he would, uh, you know, he would, he would curse and he would swear. And it wasn't because he didn't, he was living two lives. He just, he didn't know. He wasn't at a stage of maturity where he knew that hey, God wants something better for you than that. Because no one had told him that. And then once he started to learn, he started by cleaning up his speech a little bit. And then he quit smoking. And I'm, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure he's a deacon now. You know, if, if, if that church hadn't have made room for him to be himself, who knows where he would be right now, right? I want you to ask yourselves real quick. I'm, I'm going to read you the, the, the scriptural answer. Just close your eyes for a moment and just ask yourself, where would I be right now if Jesus hadn't have made room for me? And I'm not even talking if he, if he hadn't, you know, if he hadn't died on the cross for us. If Jesus had not made room for you in his heart, where, where would you be right now? You can go to the next slide there, Corey. Ephesians 2, 1 to 6 tells us the answer. This is, this is direct from, from the pen of Paul. He's not here to speak, or I would have said his mouth. As for you, all of us, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. There is so much packed into there. Where would we be if Jesus hadn't made room for us? This section, this, this bit of scripture tells us very clearly that if we're not following God, we're following someone else. If we're not subscribed to Jesus, we're following a different ruler. Point is, we are designed to be ruled. We are designed to have something guiding us. As much as we want to think we are, we are we will never be completely autonomous. Paul tells us that there is a ruler of the kingdom of air, that there is a spirit in this world that is at work in those who are disobedient. There is a spirit in this world that is at work promoting the opposite values of God, that is trying to oppose God's will, that is trying to push back against God's kingdom. If God didn't make room for us by sending Jesus to rescue us, we would still be spiritually dead. That's what it means when Paul says you were dead in your transgressions and sins. There's a spiritual wasteland, a spiritual death there. And of course, there's a different connotation as well because Old Testament tells us that the wage of sin is death. So that spiritual death is absolute. A spiritual death means that when you die, you are cut off from God. 
If God didn't make room for us, just think about this. If God didn't make room for us, there would be no mercy spoken over us. There would be no grace spoken into our life. There would be no reason for us to hope for a heaven. Because it would be unattainable without God making that room. So since God made room for us, what do we do next? Well, I mean, gratitude is naturally the outpouring, which is a big part of worship. Worship comes from a a heart of gratitude for everything that, that God has done. But this is where we go back to to our text. Uh, Peter tells us, this is, this is what Peter says, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. The promise of salvation, the promise of future, the promise of hope, the promise of grace, the promise of mercy, all of these promises, they are for you. And you means you and you and you and every other you in the world. But not doesn't just stop there. It also goes for, for their children and all who are far off. The promise is for every single person. You know, there's a song that people like to listen to now, and it's called The Blessing. Maybe you've heard of it. <clears throat> if you haven't, I strongly advise it, but have some Kleenex nearby. All of us were once far off. All of us. Every single one of us. We were all far off. We, we all have wayward moments. We all have rebellious periods. We've all got that story of that time when we weren't very close to God. We were all in need of a Savior. And now that we've, we, and of course I'm talking to the believing community, we have found that Savior. We have found that hope. We have found that promise. And now it's our job to make room for others that are still far off. As we said during communion this morning, this table is as much to remind us of those who aren't sitting at the table as it is to remind us of who is there. The table is as much to remind us that there are still souls that need to experience Jesus. The joy and salvation that we've found, that you have found, is not just for you. It's not for you alone. It's a gift that's been freely given by grace with the intent that you tell others about it. Have you ever been shopping and you got a really great deal on something? What's the first thing you want to do? You want to tell everyone how much you paid for it, right? Look at this new cell phone. It's awesome. I got it on sale. It was only... Fill in the blank. Look at these shoes. They're so cute. They were on sale. I only paid whatever. Would you believe that I got 50% off sticker price for this thing? When something good happens to us, the first thing we want to do is tell other people. We want to tell others when something good happens. You won't believe what happened today. I got a new job. I got a letter from my grandma who I haven't heard from in a while. I found my cat. It was under the shed. Whatever. When something good happens, you want to tell others about it, right? So why aren't we telling others about God? Why aren't we, why aren't we telling other people that there is, there is a space where they can ask their questions, where they can be authentically themselves and not be judged and not be talked down to? See, Acts tells us that when we make room for others, meaning we intentionally order ourselves, order our life, order our church services. When we make room for others with the community in mind, both our local and global community, we're going to see something beautiful happen. The number of people being added to the kingdom increases daily. When we make room for others to experience what we've experienced, people can't help but naturally gravitate towards it. They want to be involved. They want a piece of it. And if if I haven't already made this abundantly clear, and I'm going to steal this from Andy Stanley a little bit, because he said it best, and my good friend Pastor Joel has told me that there's no ownership in the kingdom. So I'm going to, maybe steal is the wrong word, I'm going to appropriate this. Jesus made this clear. 
every single person you are ever eyeball to eyeball with is someone who is cherished, loved, valued, cared for by God every bit the same as you, whether you like that person or not. <laughs> whether you like them or not, God loves them. It's inherent in our Christ DNA <clears throat> that we in turn make room for as many people as possible. Because we're a people that includes others and we share what we found, this is why the board and I believe that a capital campaign to rejuvenate our lower level to make this building as accessible, engaging, safe, comfortable, whatever adjective you want to use, we feel like this is the right thing to do. In light of everything that, that Paul has taught us in Ephesians, we don't want to see our neighbors left in that state. We don't want to see our friends, in, and we don't want to see our, you know, the, the, you know, it might just be that lady who works at, at Tim Hortons. Or, you know, to you it might just be, the guy who works at the bank. But they have a name. They are somebody to someone. And even if they're nobody to you, they're someone to God. And we need to be situating ourselves in a position where we can, where we can pose the question, where we can offer the invitation. We can't force people to come in. We can't force people to join us. But what we can do is invite people to come and see what God is doing. And this is the beautiful thing about kingdom work. It's not about us doing stuff. It's not about having fancy PowerPoints and it's not about, you know, having, having you know, top-notch worship and it's not about having a, a message that is carefully crafted. It's about simply posing a question and offering an invitation and that question is, are you searching for something? And the invitation is, come and see. That's exactly what Jesus did with all of his disciples. At no point did he say, hey, um, you know, you're not doing anything. You want to come hang out with me for a little bit? He didn't give any of the disciples any information. He didn't say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm the son of God. We're going to do this. We're going to establish this church. It's going to be great. It was, hey, come and see. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me and I'll show you something. There was never any sign this paperwork. There was never any, it was come and see. And Jesus took that come and see very seriously because there was, if you remember, uh, you know, there, there was one man who wanted to follow Jesus. But he said, first I have to go home and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Follow me. Come and see. I'm here now. There's no time to lose. Time for waiting is over. The time for sitting on your hands is over. I'm here. I'm waiting. Follow me. I'm doing something. Come and see. Check it out for yourself. So as I've already said, I'm just going to briefly go over this, but this, this making room for others. We have set a goal of raising $5,000. And it's not about everybody giving an equal amount of money. It's about everybody engaging in an equal amount of sacrifice, essentially. Whenever we give to something, we, we're, that's a sacrifice. We're giving something that we could spend elsewhere and we're you know, friends of mine just, they gave me a little box of straw. That was a sacrifice. It was a very, maybe a very small sacrifice, but it was still a sacrifice. Something that they could have used for themselves, they decided to give to me. So $5,000. Um, and once we hit, I, I believe we need about $1,000 for stage one. So once we get that first thousand in, we're going to start the work down there. And this money is going to be used. Uh, I wrote it all down because I don't want to miss anything here. The money will go to renovating our lower level, update the carpet in the paint, the furnishings, 
It'll create a fun, safe, engaging space where we can serve our kids, our youth, our young adults in the community. It'll function as a space to hold meetings, small groups. Uh, you can just hang out and drink coffee. You know, God willing, pandemic when it's over, wouldn't it be great to show up early for church? You can go downstairs, you can, maybe we'll have something up here. You can grab a cup of coffee, go have a, yeah, go downstairs, grab a cup of coffee, have a seat on a nice comfortable couch and just have some fellowship with your friends. You wanna have a quiet spot to pray, you, you know? The list goes on and on and on. The fact is that younger, the younger generation, and I say younger with a caveat because you know, younger generation now is, you know, I would say 50 and, un and, and, and under. Because, and I, the reason I say that is because the Christian population, the Christian age in, in North America is a little bit older. There's a lot more, there's a lot more adults participating in the kingdom than there are young folk. That's just the way it is. But they're hungry, they're searching, and we need to provide a place where they can engage with one another and encounter a real living God. By renovating our space, it will allow us to serve the entire family. It'll get us one step closer to truly being a multi-generational church where we can see our kids grow and mature into young leaders and torch bearers who will carry on the mission of God, mission of God long after we are gone, including myself. So as you feel led, please th consider prayerfully giving to this. Um, as I already said, in a, make sure it's in an envelope that is marked building. Uh, $5,000, it, it, it's a lot of money. It's not chump change. You can do a lot with $5,000. But if I, we all do our bit, and I will be giving this to this. My family and I will be investing in this as well. Some people can give a lot. Some people can only give a little. It doesn't matter. God sees that giving and He blesses. He blesses us when we give for the sake of others. He blesses us when we give to make room for others. And He blesses us when we think of others before ourselves. So if you would consider, uh, consider giving to that, I would greatly appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to partnering with you in this next stage of our ministry. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we are gathered and that we are not... <sighs> thank you that we are not beholden to this world. Thank you that we are able to impact this world and we are able to speak life into this world and we are able to intersect with this world, but that you have given us a way so that we don't have to succumb to this world. Thank you that you would give us a hope a hope for strength and a hope for tomorrow and a hope for help in times of need. Father, thank you that you made room for me and that you made room for us. Thank you that our, our, our stories and our baggage and our, our, our faults and our failures, thank you that they were not too much to bear. And though we can never fully repay We can never fully repay the gift that you have given us. Lord, I pray that you would take our, our, our talents and our gifts and our worship and all that we have and that you would use them to grow your kingdom and that we may be partners in the kingdom with you. And as we prepare to make, make way for others in, in this church, Lord, I pray that you would as always, that you would be the, the steward, that you would be the head, and that you would guide us and lead us, and that you would bless this mission that we are partaking in. Pray that you would bless this, um, this, this goal that we have, Lord, and I pray that you would provide the funds, that you would provide the means for us to impact our community. Thank you for my friends that are here today, Lord. Give them peace in these, in these crazy times, Lord. Let them know that you are with them and that you are for them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Make sure that they know, Lord, that you are the God who will not grow weary, that you are the God who does not sleep, and that all things are made new in you. May the Lord bless you.
keep you, make his face shine upon you, and give you much peace. Amen.